don't know how many of you are on Facebook, but um, every now and then I get a bit tempted. I get a bit tempted by some of the things that have been sold on Facebook, online. And this one day I must have been feeling a little bit down because I got caught twice. And when I say I got caught twice, I got out my Visa card and I purchased. <laughs> the first thing that I got, I saw this amazing uh, projector. It was as advertised as an LED projector and it could fit in the palm of your hand. And I thought, awesome! How good is this? And it's only like $99.99. And it, it's high quality, high definition. And um, as soon as I got it, I unwrapped it like it was Christmas. I took it out and I put it up against my bedroom wall. I plugged it on, turned it on, shot it on the wall, and I went, oh, maybe the focus is wrong. So I changed the focus. It was worse. <laughs> I just spent $100 and this LED projector that was meant to be amazing, that could fit in the palm of your hand, you could carry anywhere, be portable. It wasn't high definition at all. It was like pixelated and it was blurry and I couldn't even read the writing. Oh, I was so disappointed. And all of a sudden, sudden I was getting these emails from this company and I'm just like, I really don't trust this company. <laughs> I'm not going to buy anything from them again. And so at the moment, I'm still trying to get my money back. <laughs> trust. Now, you notice the title is called A Generous Life. I am steward. You thought I was Tim. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is that every single one of us here are actually a steward to God. We're really in a partnership with him. Being created by him, we are on this earth for a reason. And today, in particular, about a generous life, I want to talk about trust. Trusting God's promises. Who do you really trust? It was interesting, someone else I saw this morning had a haircut and uh, he mentioned to me that um, the barber or the hairdresser went a bit close and uh, the hairdresser or the barber said, trust me. <laughs> Does that give you confidence? It's an interesting experience when maybe you lose something that you wish you hadn't fully lost, but this concept of trust, what does it really mean to trust God and his promises? You know, one of my favourite verses, and maybe it's yours as well, is Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths crooked. Straight. He will make your paths straight. How often do we struggle with this concept of trusting God with all of our heart? Now, the, um, the word in the Hebrew, trust, Hebrew, batash is the, uh, the Hebrew word here, which has the meaning to trust, to have confidence in, to rely on someone or something with all our heart, to be sure with all of our heart. And another concept is to be bold with all of our heart. That's interesting, isn't it? That that can all be in a word of trust. To be confident, to rely, to be secure and to be bold. It's not a tentative trust, but a full dependence on God, all in. God's word is full of promises for us, but how can we trust his promises like this one? You know, when I was a student, uh, when I was studying nursing, I don't know how it happened, but they, um, they trusted me with the money, and I became the nurse's treasurer. And so we'd have meetings and I would get out my little sheet and this is how much money we have or this is how much money we've used. And um, we had a special retreat coming up and so I was the one who would be collecting all the money. And uh, I felt quite proud of myself. I got to collect all this money. I collected it all. 
And you know what? I put it away. I put it away in a safe place in my dormitory room. And then a few days later, I went back to have a look at the money. And you know what? It had gone. And you know what? I struggled with this because I'm like, I'm sure I put it in that secret spot. And I thought about everyone that lived around me in this dormitory. I thought, I know these guys. No one would do this. No one. So it had me beat. And the scary thing was I now had to go and talk to the, um, the teachers that were taking us on this excursion about how I don't have the money anymore. And so I went and spoke to them and I told them that it was there and that it's not. I'm not sure where it is. And the amazing thing was they, they trusted me. They, they trusted my story was true. And to this day I don't know where that money went. But I'm telling you, I hid it well in my room. I'm nearly like, are there cameras in my room somewhere? Like someone spying on me at night? But when you have your trust broken, you sort of uh, start to be a bit more wary about who you do trust or trust in. There was a pastor, Steve Atterburn. He's a pastor in America, Indiana, author as well. He just wrote, trust. Trust is an assurance of love. The people I trust in my life are the people I know love me. It's important to know that for someone to have my absolute and unswerving trust, I have to know that they really love me. They can't just like me. They can't just be pretty fond of me. They can't just think I look good in a particular suit or spoke well at a particular conference. No. They have to love me deeply, sincerely, honestly, truly. Grow love, trust will follow. Grow love, trust will follow. Broken promises. I think from my observation, one of the most painful broken promises is a broken marriage promise, a vow. For those of you who are married, you may have said this to each other on the day, before God and in the presence of family and friends, will you, I'm just taking the groom first, you, groom, have this woman, the bride, to be your wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the sacred estate of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honour her, cherish her, in sickness and in health? In prosperity and adversity, and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her. So long as you both shall live, do you now so declare? And the groom says, I do. And the bride goes through the same vow and says, I do. Put this into an analogy of God being the groom to his bride Israel or the church with these vows. Just a text here from Isaiah 54, 5, and it reads, For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. For your maker is your husband, an amazing concept, and we know in the New Testament there's the same sort of imagery with Jesus as the groom and the church, the bride, and in Revelation. And so I wanted to share a little bit from Moses to start with, and this concept of being a bride to God. Let's have a look. Then Moses went up to God... And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possessions. And you can start to see how this is, this is the covenant, like the vows. 
happening here. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, listen to this. We will do everything the Lord has said. It's like they're saying in the marriage vow, I do. I do. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Broken promise. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods, so we will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf and they have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. (coughs) It's... um, it's amazing here, this, this thought of acting so quickly. They've just come out of Egypt. They've had a, incredible miracles that they've witnessed and seen. And here they are. They're making a calf of gold to worship and bow down to. I just want to make this Exodus 22. The Lord emphasises here, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So God made it very clear who he was. And when he first spoke to to Moses, I am. Tell Pharaoh, I am has sent you. There's no doubt who God was on who he is to the Israelites. They are his people. They are his bride. They have said, I do to him. And yet now they have turned to other gods. I have seen these people... The Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation, speaking to Moses. But Moses sought the favour of the Lord. He said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and might? You know that the Egypt, the Egyptians, they will start talking about us. This God with a mighty hand has brought us out just to slaughter us, to destroy us. He emphasizes this part here to God. Moses says, Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore. (laughs) It's kind of like Moses is like the mediator between the the groom and the bride. (laughs) And it's like, Moses to God, remember what you said, what you agreed to. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And unfortunately they went through still plague. The Levites came over. They strapped on swords and went through the camp and 3,000 people's lives were taken. That was the light version of everyone being taken out by God's anger. And he had the right. (laughs) He had the right. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. How awesome is that? Because often you might be the same as me. I'm reading these stories, like this one in particular with Moses and the Israelites. And it's like, how do they do that so quickly? Turn away from God. And it's like, oh, wait a second. What did I do yesterday? When I'm unfaithful. God is standing there in every single one of our lives and saying, I am faithful to you. 
I am still here even though you have gone off with someone else. About 340 years after the Exodus, about 340 years after the Exodus, we have Gideon. You see, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Into the hands of the Midianites. And the Midianites, as well as also the Amalekites and other eastern peoples invaded, invaded them, the Israelites, took out their cattle, their crops, their food and left poor Israel pretty hungry and desperate, living in the clefts of the rocks, in the mountains, doing life pretty tough. Why? Because they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Here is this picture of of grace. (laughs) Even though they've done evil, that they've left that connection with God, they cry out. A prophet is sent. And the prophet hears what God says and the prophet says this is what the Lord the God of Israel says I brought you up out of Egypt out of the land of slavery I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors I drove them out before you and gave you their land I said to you this is the reminder part I said to you I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, for you have not listened to me. So God is like saying, God is like saying, I'm in the right here. You've left me. It's got so bad after seven years that the people have just cried out to God. But he hasn't left them. The angel of the Lord appears near the oak in Ophrah that belongs to Joash. This is um, Gideon's father. And this is where Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. And he was doing it in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites because they were just taking everything. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. (laughs) Mighty warrior. Gideon was taken back. He's not a mighty warrior at all. He says to God, he says, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? Remember I said 340 years earlier, they've heard about these amazing things that their ancestors experienced through the Exodus. Did the Lord not bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Just pause there for a moment. (laughs) Go in the strength you have. He didn't have to go off to, to a special warrior school for the next maybe three or four or five or ten years before he was ready. But go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. Reminds me of a few sentences. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. This is Paul saying, after experience, I'm sure. And then God mentions 
my grace to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And you can see this in the story of Gideon, can't you? He's the least in his family and he's the least, their clan is the least in Manasseh. (laughs) They're nothing. And the Lord answered, I'll be with you. This is a promise. I will be with you. Whatever you're facing right now, right now, this promise is for you as well. The Lord is saying to you, I will be with you. And you will strike down the problem that is ahead. For Gideon, it was the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if I have found favour in your eyes, give me a sign that it really is you taking, talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said he would wait. And the Lord waited. Gideon got, went and got the meat, the unleavened bread, the broth, poured it out as directed. And the angel of the Lord consumed this meal, this offering, if you like, consumed it. And then the angel of the Lord himself disappeared. Gideon was just, whoa, what what has just happened? I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord told him, don't be afraid, you're not going to die. You're not going to go. Go and take your father's altar of Baal, and the Asherah pole, and rip it all down. He's a little bit scared still, so he does it at night time. He goes out with the second bull that he was told to pick. Must be a good strong one. And um, he took this bull, knocked down the altar, knocked down this pole, and prepared an altar for the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. The God of heaven and earth. And he sacrificed. There was a bit of room around the next day, like, who has done this? Who has taken down our, our altar of Baal and Asherah pole? And after a bit of uh, detective work, they found out that it was Gideon. But the father stood up and said, well, if Baal is God, he will defend for himself. Pretty much just leave my son alone. <laughs> Baal can defend for himself if he is a god. Gideon. Need a little bit more help. God, I just want to ask you, can I put out this fleece? Make it wet and the ground dry. God does that, exactly. He picks it up the next morning, he picks up the fleece, he wrings it out and it makes a bowl of water. God, can you just do one more thing for me? Can we do it, change it around, switch it around, put out the fleece, make it dry and the ground will wet. And it was exactly like that. And then he found 32,000 men to come fighting with him. The Lord said, that's too many. And whoever is afraid can go home. How many of you would be afraid to go to war? I think I'd put my hand up. Thank you so much for the ticket of freedom. I'm going to go home. Family. That left 10,000, but that was still too many people because God knew if 10,000 men were to fight, They would think they were the ones who won the battle. Go down to the river, take a drink. Those who lap with their hands, drink it. I will take them. There was 300. 300 of these mighty men that lapped, brought the water up to their mouths. This is it. And then he gets ready. He prepares his enemy, his army, sorry, for the enemy. 300 men but still, the Lord says, get up and go down. And, but God says, if, if there's some fear in there, if you feel a bit afraid, I'm going to do something for you as well. Go into the camp. I don't know what would be more scary when I think about it, to have a sword and everything and get ready and run into a camp or whether just to walk down into a camp <laughs> by yourself with your servant without the other 300 I think 300 is better than two. (laughs) But here he is. He says, go down into the camp and I'll reveal something to you. I'll encourage you. 
Because we need encouraging sometimes, don't we? We need to pick me up. So he goes down. He's outside a tent with his servant, Pura. And they hear in the tent, these two friends, one is saying, I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midian camp. It struck the tent with such a force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be none other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard this, heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. I don't know whether I'm seeing things or making things up, but him and his servant are in an enemy camp. He hears the dream. It is awesome because they're talking about him having victory. And then what's the next thing that he does? Am I seeing things or does he worship God? He worshiped God and then he returned to the camp. Maybe it just doesn't tell us that he's like a thousand meters away before he actually all happens, the worship part. But what an amazing concept to think that he's actually still right outside the tent and he starts worshiping God for the victory that God is going to give. Now, that's a hard thing to do. I can't really think of a time where I've been in a really hard time and I've been able to worship him, having that faith that he's going to come through, that I can trust him that completely. But I just love the thought that Gideon was still outside the tent and he's worshipping God. (laughs) Maybe it was just a quiet power up to God. Praise you, God. And then he walked off with his servant. But maybe the camp is just so loud anyway because it tells us that when they did come into the camp or about to attack the camp, it was about 10 p.m., so you can imagine probably a whole army being quite loud and maybe there's, yeah, lots of things happening. So he went back up to his men. They're in their hundreds, divided up 300. They've got their, what have they got? <laughs> they've got a, a horn and they've got nothing. <laughs> they have a torch in a jar. And so they're told to follow Gideon. They blow their horns, they smash their jars, and their lights are held up. This awesome image that was going down onto this Midianite camp, so powerful that God had the Midianite soldiers getting up and killing each other. So many men died that there was about 120,000 men of the sword and the enemy came down due to this battle. And I'm sure there were a lot more as well. But it was a victory. 300 men under God's guidance. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon was the charge. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. In Numbers 23, 19, it just mentions God is not human, that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfil? Balaam, under the prophetic inspiration of God, (laughs) declared some amazing truths about God. He is not human. He does not lie. He does not change. Isn't that a good reason to put our trust in him? That he is a God that keeps his promise. He did for Gideon. He did for Moses. 
I want to share something with you. I found this quite interesting. Maybe all the um, logistics aren't fully 100% correct, but interesting to think about in regards to Moses. Moses and the people were in the desert. But what was he going to do with them? They had to be fed. And feeding two to three million required a lot of food. The Bible tells us that there were 600,000 men besides women and children. So you can quite easily get two to three million quite easily when you think about it. True? True. That's a lot of people, two to three million. The people needed 2,000 tonnes of food each day. Imagine being the leader of that group having to provide for that family 2,000 tonnes of food each day. To bring that much food each day would require three freight trains, each two kilometres long. (laughs) You know when you're standing there at a train crossing, the train just keeps on going and keeps on going and keeps on going? Three of those, three of those, two kilometres long. In the desert, they needed firewood to cook and keep warm. Each day, this would take 4,000 tonnes of wood and a few more freight trains, each four kilometres long. Of course, they needed water. If they only had enough to drink, wash a few dishes and bathe every few days, it would take 40 million litres each day. And a freight train with 400 tank cars extending more than eight kilometres just to bring water. I don't know about you, but when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, how awesome is God? He took a man and two and three million people into a desert. (laughs) And And then another thing, they had to get across the Red Sea in one night if they went on a narrow path, say double file, the line would be 1,300 kilometres long and would require 35 days and nights to get through. Pharaoh's got you. (laughs) So there had to be an opening in the Red Sea, like five kilometres wide, so that they could walk 5,000 abreast to get over in one night. But God knew this, didn't he? Each time they camped at the the end of the day, they needed a campground 1,200 kilometres square. It's huge. They journeyed in the desert for 40 years. In the desert for 40 years. Do you think Moses worked out (laughs) all of this beforehand? Do you think Moses had this amazing plan of providing all this water before he left Egypt? No. It was God who was going to provide and lead them. Moses put his trust in God. God handled things every day for 40 years. If you think God can't handle your problems, think again. I like that thought. Just reflect on Moses and Gideon. They both have to trust God. But when you look at their lives, really they both have generous lives. When they companioned with God in trust. Do you want a generous life? Where you can trust God like that? A generous life that actually impacts so many people. So many people. Another Facebook experience, Pedro Papika. He's a missionary priest in Madagascar. Some of you might have seen him on Facebook. But um, I just felt really encouraged just to share this with you. He's actually a priest and um, he was really touched by the scenes that he saw in the garbage, the garbage area. He saw children living in the garbage dump and families living in the garbage dump. 
This is just one of the little kids, yeah, little hand. And here they are, just walking through some of the, uh, the rubbish there. Uh, Pedro, he, um, he had skills from back in Europe. He was taught by his parents several skills, and one of them was um, how to yeah, grow crops. And so he taught them how to make rice and plant it. He also touched the children's hearts and the young people by playing with them, in particular soccer. He also knew how to build homes. He was taught the uh, bricklaying trade by his father. And because of what his knowledge, he was generous in giving that and taught this community that were living in the dump how to build their own homes. Quite an amazing um, image. There's even more homes than that, actually, than that photo. But it gives you an idea of from a dump <laughs> to an incredible turnaround. Incredible turnaround. This place um, is called the Hill of Courage. The dump changed into a paved streets, amazing brick homes, because they were taught how to look after themselves. And finally, just this picture. I just love this picture of Pedro. And it, whether it's Pedro or whether it's you or me or whether it's Moses or Gideon, It's really based on if we trust God to be able to live a generous life for him. To be able to live a generous life. See how generous a life you can live for God when you trust in him. God doesn't change. He doesn't lie. He can be trusted just like Moses did and Gideon did. And in these stories as well, we can see God's amazing love and his grace to his people. Will you trust God with all your heart? Will you trust God with all your heart? So you can live a generous life. God speaks to us and he says, Go in the strength you have. And save the lost out of the enemy's hands. Am I not sending you? Am I not sending you? I think we have a song now.